Yo, 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 what's up? Guess what? It's Monday and uh, I am high on caffeine and uh, this is gonna be a ride. So, because we're all quarantined and my sole purpose is to make people laugh, I have made the most intense Patreon episode so far. So, of course, I have to release it to the public, mostly as a clickbait, uh, because I want you guys to actually sign up to Patreon, because I post shit ton of content there. But also because I love you, appreciate you, and want you to have yet another episode to listen to. And because I'm funny as fuck. <laughs> just just uh, humility is one of my best qualities, okay? Let me just talk about it for a sec. <laughs> well, here it is. Are you ready? Are you goddamn ready? Hola, hola, caracola. Hi, strangers. Hi, patrons. What's up? How's life? You had some time for the extra content, didn't you? So, as I was covering uh, Robert Ben Rhodes last week and then searching for those disturbing pictures, uh, I was like, huh, what other disturbing pictures are here? Because that's where my mind goes, okay? This is, this is who I am. You can't change it. So, I found, like these old sets of pictures from like the 90s the 90s i forgot anyways it's like from the 30s and it's like wow look at these old timey pictures of uh, women being bound what is this all about i have never covered an old timey case so uh this is why we're here <laughs> but i promise this i just as i was reading it, i was like this is uh borderline insane especially for the 1920s and 30s so uh I'm gonna make it worth your while, okay? Diving it straight in, head first, like in a pool, and then, woo, dolphin style. Oh my god, the head caffeine. Okay. I'm covering Glamour style. <laughs> no, no, no. Glamour Girl Slayer. Or his actual name was Harvey Glettman. So he was an old timey stranger killing three women. Ones that molesting them and taking pictures of them bound stopped being enough for him. He killed Judith Dahl. Ruth Dahl, Shirley Ann Bridgeford in the desert until one day he found a woman who wouldn't let him turn her into a victim. We have our killer, we've got our victims. What was the motive? Going into discovery, I just realized I said stranger and not strangler because autocorrect doesn't like true crime apparently. <laughs> so, just as I wanted to explain why he was called slayer, because he didn't actually, you know, slay in a modern version of that word, but he also didn't slay in the slashing somebody's throat. No, he loved it close and personal. After he's done with them, he would just, yeah, personally strangle them. He attempted to continue with his modus operandi, but actually failed for once. Once he faced the wrong victim, 28-year-old Lorraine Vigil. So, Vigil was a badass, but apart from that, she was also registered with the modeling agency when she was contacted by Glattman for a photo shoot. So, this is your typical, what's that guy's name? Rodney Alcala, like serial killer that uh, preyed on to young models by, you know, the promise of a photo shoot. Oh, look at this, look at my pictures, look at my portfolio. I actually had a decent one, especially because this is very old timey. And while these agencies didn't actually understand yet, or at least didn't pick up on that, because as you remember, there was only three victims that he was found and charged with, so nobody was clocking that, hey, these models actually disappear after having a photo shoot with this guy. Well, not until now. So again, he was charming enough that Vigil actually went into the car with him, and she wasn't actually worried until he just starting full speed going to the opposite direction of Hollywood, where they were headed. Always have... Okay. okay. So this is obviously not the advice if you have a time machine and you're going into 1920s to prevent a crime. Let me know. Let me know what crime would you prevent. Oh my god, this is such a good topic, okay? If you could go back in time, what is the crime that you would prevent? Or what to solve? Or like, yeah, prevent, hopefully, rather than solve, because are you psychopaths? Okay. <laughs> so in this time and age, please, please, please have a route outlined. That doesn't matter if you call an Uber, it doesn't matter whoever is picking you up, whichever cab company, you know, especially, okay, I'm not talking like right now, maybe you are going by cabs right now, but like always have the route outlined, always know like the actual destinations, you know, in the future once this whole shit passes and have it outlined, um, outlined so that when you are in a cab, you actually know, it's like maybe they're using Waze or, you know, maybe they're actually going 
towards different routes, but still going the same way, going the same direction, okay? This is why I hate taking a cab. God, I'm so paranoid in life. <laughs> I literally run around the trucks, hate taking cabs. But life is very fun, yeah, it's totally not like complete paranoia on the streets. It's great, it's, it's great, anxiety is lovely. So we just said, quote, I did not become alarmed, however, until we entered the Santa Ana freeway and he began driving at a tremendous speed. He wouldn't answer my questions or even look at me, Vigil said later. So this is one of those typical things like we've seen with Ben Rhodes last week as well. It's just like he just goes into that zone where he has the power and just completely ignores, ignores the victim, dehumanizes, like they're not important anymore, it's all about him and this event for him. So now, after doing this, he thinks he actually still has full control over her. He claimed his car had a flat tire and pulled over to the side of the road, and once the car was parked, he pulled his gun on Vigil and tried to tie her up. But this woman, she grabs his gun, okay, by the muzzle, yeah? And she tries to wrestle it from Gletman. What he is saying is, again, this is why never let them get you to a second location, okay? So he tells her, like, he will not kill her. Like, yeah, she has the gun, bitch. Like, you, you stand first of all, no chance. But it's not like she's gonna hand you a gun when you tell her that. Like, she knew better. So in this fight, you know, it's like a telenovela fight, yeah? He accidentally fires a bullet. It closes on that episode. And you're just like, who has been shot? It's like very dramatic. Both of them are pulling in the faces. Like, it might have been one or the other. Can you tell I have been watching this shit since I was three years old? Oh my god, this is how I imagine every like every scene where they fight over a gun. <laughs> Fuck my life. We are opening up ne next episode, yeah? This is this is gonna be the resolution time. Who has been shot? Guess what? It's been Vigil. But the bullet just grazed her skirt and just grazed her thighs. So she's good. She's okay. She's okay. Still dramatic faces. She might be crying a bit, but it's okay. She's still kicking, right? So she bites his hand and is able to get a hold of the gun. Again, this woman is just like, this gun is mine. It's mine. Don't fuck with me. So she points it at him and holds him, like, holds him there until the police came by, which was like alerted by the passing motorists, like arrived on the scene. So like people passing by were like, yeah, let's call the police. This doesn't look nice. This doesn't look great. Which, thank fuck. So she actually holds him on the gunpoint, like, yep, you're not. This is done. Your era, your fucking life is done. And what applies to a lot of criminals, but Harvey Gladman like really just actually wanted to be caught. Not because, you know, of all this ordeal, but like as soon as he was arrested, he f confessed willingly to all of the three murders. Actually was like that person is like, oh yeah, yeah, no, let's let's go to the crime scenes. Let me just in detail explain everything to you, all right? That kind of piece of shit, which I think that partially they do just, you know, to sort of like have, you know, that last day outside also gloat about the crimes and possibly in some cases yeah to try to escape so he brings the police to the desert but like without this they actually would have never probably found these bodies because it's like deep in the desert they actually found like graves like the graves for them as well so he brought them to the actual exact locations this was good for the families of the victims okay why i said that he wanted to get hurt because of what happens next he's found guilty uh, of the two counts of first degree murder and sentenced to death a sentence he accepted willingly. Like, he specifically asked the warden to do nothing to save his life. What kind of, like, this is, like, another unhealthy relationship with death, okay? I think I don't have a particularly healthy relationship with death, but this guy is, like, next level. Like, let people try to save your ass. What the fuck are you doing? I mean, I think once I actually go into the background, because now it's coming to me, because, again, I wrote this script, like, a week ago, because that's how my life works, okay? I just come too early, and then I remember it but you'll see where the unhealthy relationship with death comes along but yeah this is just like another culmination so even at the trial he just tells the judge he wants the most direct way to a death sentence and the judge was like well you asked for it there's no way back now from this mate so just imagine the next scene is just him going into the gas chamber of san quentin state prison in 1959 no, I'm not sure if these executions were involved other people, you know, was it like proper Auschwitz or, you know, was it just one person? And then, yeah, we, we are there, right? He's dead, he just, he closed his eyes, he inhaled that motherfucking gas and he died, right? This is morbid, why did they use to 
use gas chambers in like almost what six years and then because this is a true crime comedy podcast we roll back roll that back film roll that film back into your head to his last meal because of course if there is any fucking way that i can find information on the last meal this is going to be the whole focus of this research (laughs) his last meal included bacon eggs fried potatoes steak and banana split this guy lived his life yo also 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 Oh my god, I'm losing my shit. If anybody, if you are a recruiter, or just anybody participating in an interview process, doesn't matter if it's freaking cyber, or if it's um, in an office, what you would like as your last meal is a great candidate question. I am not joking, okay? This is how, if if anybody asked me this in the past, actually one company did, and um, yeah, I didn't get a job. If any single company asked me this in the past i definitely wouldn't have gotten like any of my jobs because like i have like such a fuck you attitude towards it because i'm like no i would make them work for it okay i would take like a couple of serbian dishes including dessert and shit they would need to look up the recipes it would be like the hardest things to prepare so think about what would your last meal be be prepared for your next interviews yeah and recruiters if you're listening to this this is a great way to judge the character god i fucked up somebody's life right now (laughs) Uh, moving on to his crimes. So, Gladman's crime career started once he moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> God, what the fuck am I saying? In 1957. And he was strolling around modeling agencies looking for potential victims. And I was like, oh, I'm a professional photographer, you know. We- we've seen that fucking game being played, okay? Well, apparently not too, not often enough at that era, like for those killers to be stopped. Uh, but yeah, we've seen it uh, after and after later, and then in seventies and eighties, people were like, "Okay, this is a problem." So he'd contact these victims with offers to work for a pulp fiction magazine, and then take them back to his apartment, tie them up, and sexually assault them. And he got off. You just know because all of the pictures that I've seen were of them just like looking frightened, just being muffled and basically just tied behind the back. They're not too brutal to look at, by the way. It's just uh, the intensity is there because they just look frightened and it's probably the last pictures of them alive. And then, because the fear isn't enough, he would strangle them and then dump their bodies in the desert. So his first two victims, Judith Dahl and Ruth Mercado, are the victims he met this way through the modeling agency. He met his third victim, Shirley Ann Bridgeford, through Lonely Hearts ad in the newspapers. Now, 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 now. Now, Lonely Hearts ad is exactly what it is. It's a Tinder of the days, okay? It's just you, advertise yourself. Oh my god, remember, is it Dorotea Puente? What is that bitch that killed people on her farm? Nope, it's Belganes. How do I... How did I even just degrade the name of Belganes? <laughs> Lol. Okay, so, I'm not sure if that's what they were called back then, but yeah, it's basically, they're like, ooh, I'm a single guy of this height, and uh, yeah, my shoe size is this, so you know what that means. Yeah, that's the Lonely Hearts ads, okay? <laughs> this reminds me of this weird thing in my fucking family. I don't even know what side of my family. I think it's my dad's side. Basically... <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers when they used to publish like de- death announcements, death certificates, whatever. It wasn't a death certificate, but yeah, like announcement when somebody died in the papers, or you know, it's a small city kind of problem, okay? But <laughs> like there was this person, like this, I think it's my aunt or my grandma that literally would have the creepiest attention. Like they would buy the newspapers and then come home and be like, "Let's see who died today," and I would just look at them like, "Are you okay?" The head. Like, it's just at the back of newspapers, like, as if it was the back of a magazine, like, yep, let's just see those ads, let's just see what deals we can get, they're like, yep, let's just see, do we, did anybody we know die? I'm like, you can just ask their friends and fucking family, are you a psychopath? Yeah, but this is why I don't have best connections with um, some of my um, extended family, <laughs> because they're fucking creeps. So, where was I? Um, lonely heart said. How did I come from that to death certificates? It's just how. Where does my mind go? Lonely heart said. Yep. So she was engaged in some extensive custody battle with her ex-husband over their 14 months year old daughter. <laughs> Why do I always do this? Over 14 month year. 14 month old daughter. There's no month and year old. But why do people do this? It's one year and two months old daughter. I don't. Okay. This is another thing that pisses me off majorly. 
if you you have a child and you tell me they're aging months, I'm just gonna look at you like you're a mug and just be like, no, please tell me in years. You you do them off. You fucking turds. Why do people still do this? Okay, okay, okay. Maya, the parents, strikes again. So when she named a man named Johnny Glynn, first no imagination, just no imagination at all. So he called her, offering her a much needed fifty dollars. Okay, fifty dollars then is a lot of hundreds of dollars now, okay? Didn't Google it, it's fine. To pose for the cover of a pulp novel, so she jumped to the opportunity. She's like, this is great. So this is his first victim, right? It's him starting, so it's a bit clumsy. So when he arrived to pick her up, like none of those roommates saw any danger in him, so just like, yeah, like small what is this word? Bespectacled man. Please, don't even copy paste. Don't you don't need to know this word, yeah? Just small insignificant man, yeah? How about insignificant bespectacled? Who the fuck talks like this? Okay. But when he brought her to his apartment, he asked her to pose bound as it's for a true crime magazine. Red flags, as we all know, she didn't. It's okay. It was different times, right? And it's a pulp freaking fiction magazine. Yeah, people were like, yeah, this is how you pose for it. He's a photographer, he knows. People today would fall for this shit, okay? Let me just not even go there. And then he holds her for, at gunpoint and repeatedly rapes her. The saddest part that sort of has a bit of humor in there is that this is when he lost his virginity at the age of 29. Trust me, when we go into his background, you don't realize why. But yeah, he was a bespectacled man, didn't we, didn't we say? Then he does what he does with other victims as well. So he drives her into a secluded location in the new Mojave Desert. Mojave, yeah, Apple references, did, did they get it from this case? As we know, yeah. Griselda Blanco, she named her child Uber and then Uber got it from her, yeah? In this case, the Slayer was in Mojave Desert and Apple was like, this is it. Everybody follows true crime one way or the other. <laughs> listen, listen to wise words. God, I'm just trying to break the like fucking freaking case that this is. So he strangles her in the desert and he would just leave them there for the coyotes because he was just done with them. They were not humans, they didn't serve any purpose for him again. This is why I make fun. Because the case is grim, okay? In his own words, quote, I would make them kneel down. With everyone it was the same. It's exactly like it doesn't feel no fucking emotion, this guy. With a gun on them, I would tie this five foot piece of rope around their ankles. Then I would loop it up around their neck. Then I would stand there and keep pulling until they quit struggling. So it's sort of like behind their neck and then their ankles. So they would be like arching back. I don't know how this, their backs didn't fucking break. I hate this piece of shit. Like I just hate imagining like these things like happening to anybody. And I just left them there for the people because they serve their purpose. <sighs> I hate this guy. I hate this guy. And hate when media gives them cool fucking names for like some bullshit fucking crimes. Like, what, what the slaying thing about it? He didn't slay in a cool way? He didn't fucking slay their neck? Like, leave me alone. A media needs to stop fetishizing these criminals. Okay, where was I? Now is when he meets his next victim, so Shirley Ann Bridgeford, who's 24. Again, she's divorced and a model, and he met her through the Lonely Hearts ad, as I was saying, using a false name, George Williams. You can use as a criminal any fucking name. You're in an ad. It's not even Tinder. It doesn't have to be connected to your Instagram account, okay? Why do you choose the most basic names? <laughs> this enrages me at the same level as the crimes, okay? This is how pissed I am about this. So he picks her up. It's like all pretense they're going to go to a dance. But instead, he brings her back to his place where he tied her up, photographed and raped her before taking her to the desert where he killed her. He left the body unburied, actually, to be ravaged by animals and desert wind. Again, he just like, he's like, and sometimes he feels like, yeah, I can bury them and then still leave them for the animals to eat. And sometimes he's like, you know what? No, today is not a day. Today I'm George Williams and uh, I have the basic name. So I just, you know, don't even pull the fucking effort. Ticket. Now, as he has successfully done in the past, so he thinks this is a good way to go, right? Uh, so as he had with Dahl, he now finds his next victim, Ruth Mercado, 24, through the modeling agency. And when he arrives at her place for a planned photo shoot, he learned that she was feeling too ill to proceed. But he was just un unfazed, like, oh yeah, that that's that's fine. Like, she, has a fl she can't look like shit in the pictures, mate. 
So hours later, he still just comes back. It's like, yeah, you feel better, right? G give it a break. Calm down. Go wank in the closet. So this time, he's just like not taking no for an answer. He lets himself in and rapes her repeatedly at gunpoint throughout the night. And in the morning, he forced her to walk out to his car and then drove her to the desert where he just killed her in the usual manner. Just imagine, you have to lie next to somebody that's gonna kill you the next day. Ah, oh, man, fuck these. Fuck the old times and people leaving by themselves. Always check in with people when you're sick, okay? Just always have keywords. Again, his quotes, like, make me think like he's taking this as a trip, like, this is his normal life, this is how he thinks dating works. Because he said, quote, She was one I really liked, so I told her we were going out to a deserted spot where we wouldn't be bothered while I took uh, more pictures. We drove out to the Escondido desert and spent most of the day out in the desert. It's just, this is not a fucking date. Like, get a grip. Another quote, I took a lot more pictures and tried and tried to figure out how to keep from killing her, but I couldn't come up with any answer. I just don't do it. Just leave. If your impulses are that high, just without an explanation, leave her. Fuck it, she's safer there, like, being picked up by somebody else. It's just bullshit. If you actually thought about trying to stop to kill her, you could have stopped yourself from killing her. This is not like, oh, it's impulsive and then, like, I can't stop myself. No, you actually thought about this, so you could have, well just gone out of that situation. Now that we know what this piece of shit did, let's go and focus on uh, the whys. So let's go into discussing his background and figure out why he had the unhealthy relationship with death. The first line in the background section is just stable parents. Full stop. That's it. <laughs> Let's, let's discuss more about these stable parents. So, since he was four, he would have a, a bit of an unhealthy habit, you could call it. So, he would tie a string of rope, right, around his penis. Yep, you didn't expect that, yep. There was no build-up, no nothing. I just fucking put it on you there, yep. Rope around his penis. And then, then he would tie another end of the rope onto, um, you know, the drawer. So, uh, he would just slam his dick into the drawer. He was four, okay? He was four, yep. But I put in it's highly inappropriate. It's kind of like when you try to get your tooth out, just, you know, it's just him stretching his penis out, right? So, you know, when you try to be like as painless and just like, I want to get this tooth out when you were a kid, yeah? <sighs> but completely different. And his dad would then, since he was four years old once he spotted this, would give him the masturbation speech. <laughs> it was the, okay, it was different times, yeah? Uh, this is how we can explain this. His quote on this is, it seems like I always had a piece of rope in my hands when I was a kid. I guess I was just kind of fascinated by rope. Not the best fascination when you were a fucking four-year-old child, but yeah, then his parents actually kind of figured out that this is not normal, even though it was the 20s and um, it's pretty much not, not the best, not something that you would see, you know, your brothers and sisters do. So they bring him to the doctor. Doctor? Again, another time. Doctor here, he says that this is just a phase. Like, it's, just, it's gonna pass. That you shall pass. His exact words, yeah? Oh boy, but of course it doesn't pass. It just kind of escalates, as we as we know. So as a teenager, he had, like, shit of acne. Like, you Google this guy. He's not the best looking peas in the pod. <laughs> pee in the pod. That's an expression. Not the best looking pee in the pod. Well, that's the title of that episode sorted. So, uh, good job, good job, good job. Round of applause. I am next level hyper on caffeine. It's been almost 30 minutes recording and I'm still like on it, on it, on it. It's fine, it's fine. I just need to get more coke into my system because I need to record yet another episode. <laughs> so his dad comes into his room again and he's like, so you son, you know, I still know you masturbate a lot heavily, right? Completely, again, normal talks. So you need to stop masturbating because that's what's causing your acne. The advice, the medical advice here, guys on point. So, he also had these huge ears that he was famous for. Of course, at this point, I was just laughing at my comment on this. So, of course, that invited kids to call him Chipmunk, and which he kind of really looks like. They nailed that nickname, okay? They just nailed it. Just look at it. Just look at him online. I'll post it on Twitter or some shit. But what I put here is, today somebody would just put a hat on and make it a fashion statement. But this was the 20s and 30s and onwards, so people didn't really know that that, that can be done. You know, you just put a cap on, you're like fucking bad bunny, right? 
And Bad Bunny has perfect ears. Do you fucking diss Bad Bunny for a second? Everybody's like, who is Bad Bunny? If you don't listen to this, but if you don't know who Bad Bunny is, why, why are we here? Another thing he was famous for is that he actually feared girls. Like, he would not, like, approach other girls to speak to them. And, obviously, another habit that develops because of all of this and him just wanking by himself is he starts the with the auto pronounce it the way, the way. Auto asphyxiation. So, he just chokes himself in a bathtub. Again, the fascination with rope is on the next level. It just escalates through the years. So, parents actually would see the rope burns around his neck and uh, just brush it off. Now, this is not a time, okay? This is not a time for denial, right? I mean, this is the coronavirus time and that is the, his parents fucking denying the fact that they chose to, like, just neglect their, their rope burns. Because they're like, oh, you know, if we bring him to a GP, they're gonna say, like, it's just a phase again. No, he has a fascination with the rope. Take the rope out of the house, do something. So, before going on to his actual crimes, in his senior year, he starts getting into people's houses, taking trophies, which included a gun, but also he was the perfect kind of trophies guy, yeah, including panties, anything, any ropes he can find, and he would dare uh, bind and gag while robbing women. So he would molest them, but he doesn't rape them, because remember he's a virgin he's, since he's like 28, because he's all about that strangling himself kind of vibes. So he would jerk off next to them, disgusting. Just just the fear of somebody just jerking off next to me that I don't know or don't want somebody to jerk off next to me. Like, it's that simple. But I have to, have to visualize every single situation. God damn it. So he gets caught for a break-in, but still manages to actually graduate as the top of his class, even though he's in jail at the time. Different times. <laughs> So right now he will be expelled from school, but they're like, yeah. Imagine just calling out his name, like, oh, where is he? Well, <laughs> that is a good question, sir. Oh, why is he in prison? That is another good question, sir. Let's just ignore it. He's still top of the class. Hush it, hush it. Don't let the media get it out. So after his senior year, he moves to New York to start working as a repairman. And he uh, basically goes into the house of a couple and he uh, binds them. So husband manages to take the binds off and they went to the police. So he again just jerked off in front of a wife, molested her. And then the husband luckily manages to hush him off. He ran out of the house and uh, they went to the police. So now he, now is when they call him Phantom Bandit. Phantom Bandit. Another, another fucking cool name. Why giving cool names media? What the fuck is wrong with you? And uh, he's in jail again. So they finally, somebody like realizes maybe this is not the healthiest guy we've ever seen in prison. So they move him to the psychiatric facility. And he is held, but he's then released. Plus, it's again a case where a criminal could have been stopped multiple occasions. But they're like, oh, you know, we are filled up. You know, he's, he's fine. He's recovered. So it's like he was sentenced twice before this. Like, judges would just parole him out like by dismissing the case on good behavior. What is wrong with people? Why did everybody get out on anything just because of overcrowding? You know what, by the way, check out Marshall Project. Is it Marshall Project? The Marshall Project. It has really good articles on coronavirus in prisons. Yeah, on like how many people have been released because of it. It's just kind of in my head, well, how are we releasing suddenly this many people? Like either their sentences weren't right in the first place, or we're just releasing criminals and creating more work for the police because they actually shouldn't all be out. Now, some actual triggers apart from his childhood that have happened to strike up his crimes is that his dad died of diabetes when he was 24 and his psychiatrist retired so it was like trigger after trigger and then followed by auto association fetishes so let's uh, briefly discuss the motives Okay, I definitely think we can't neglect all of the triggers that I just mentioned and finalize the episode with. But still, like, I feel like this is a more, a lot more deep rooted when it comes to his like obsession with auto asphyxiation, his fixation on it, and then this obsession over over rope. Because this is gonna end up being his modus operandi. So you shouldn't have been neglected in the first place. But then as well, it's like how many people just let it happen. So the primary motive, I would definitely say, is 
is, well, condition, fetish, whatever you want to call it, that uh, has been noticed ever since he was a child and was never properly cured. So it's again that thing of like, yes, somebody has been hospitalized, somebody has been in jail for it, but again, if you haven't cured it once they are a child or once even when they're adult, and if they don't want to fix it themselves, then this is what it leads to. And as a secondary motive, I would actually say he would feed off notoriety later. Because he just, he was given all these glamorous freaking titles, so he was like, yeah, might as well continue, you know. And uh, then it's kind of like, this is part of what I do, this is part of who I am, this is how I kill, this is my modus operandi, and it's how I'm famous for the people. So it's just like, at some point, that also feeds onto that fetish and that obsession. You know, I'm telling you, as a psychologist on fetishes and everything fetishized, yeah? So let me know what you think, and if you're an actual psychologist, yeah, describe this in, uh, you know, your professional terms to me, and then I'm going to have a corrections corner, and uh, thank you very much if you're doing that. <laughs> the sources for this podcast have been Serial Chillers Podcast, I can't believe these guys stopped recording, appeal, appeal to Serial Chillers Podcast to, to go back to it. Okay, maybe not if they, like, don't like it. What am I doing? <laughs> Hollywood Crime Scene Podcast, Wikipedia, Murderpedia, and all that's interesting. What is interesting is like the gift that keeps on giving, okay? I use it probably for like every single episode. It's just life. It's just such great articles and just all concise. Like, you know, but good images. Kind of like Wikipedia, but like in the smaller condensed format. God, they're completely different websites. What am I about? How high on caffeine am I right now? Very high, very high, very high on caffeine. Okay, fuckers, I'm gonna sign off because I need to record the episode for the next week in April on Benjamin Bugsy Seagull. And I only have as much caffeine left in my body to like just burn out, you know, so that I sleep nicely. And it's still sort of sunny outside, so I still wanna do it during daytime so that my brain can tell you this story again, like a movie, so you visualize it like it's 1920s and you are there with me. Even though we haven't lived in that era, I'll bring you there. <laughs> The promises that I make and then the way I tell the story just don't balance out, do they, my? No, they don't. Uh, so, uh, outro, outro, outro time, outro time. Keep hyped on caffeine and uh, keep making the world a better place. One motive at a time. Bye!